Oh, yeah. And now, our feature presentation. He said, get an education which will benefit their own people and not education adding to the storehouse of their teacher. We need education, but an education which removes us from the shackles of slavery and servitude. Get an education, but not an education which leaves us in an inferior position and without a future. Get an education, not an education that leaves us looking for the slave master for a job. Mr. Muhammad's plans are on a grand scale. Here is a man who understands the nature of economics. He knows the black man must have possession of the land to provide in the broadest sense all natural resources as we find them in nature. These natural resources include not only the land part of the Earth's surface, but rivers and lakes, mineral resources, and natural vegetation. His sons, Herbert and Elijah Muhammad Jr., launched a program on Back to the Farm to stimulate interest among the followers to want to own land and getting away from the brainwashed trick of the slave master in desiring to be a janitor or an elevator operator rather than being a farmer or owner of land to produce his and others' needs. Remaining sad over the poor living conditions of our black people, Mr. Muhammad purchased a 12-unit family apartment building at 8201 South Vernon to move more of his followers who, like other black people, are denied suitable living quarters at a scale comparable to their wages because they were black. From 1955 through 1959, the Muslims' Detroit Temple No. 1 was located at 5401 John C. Lodge. The building since then has been demolished. At a time when the hatred and self-hatred of black was so great that even black newspapers such as the Pittsburgh Courier were only read behind closed doors. The addition of the column, Mr. Muhammad Speaks, to the Pittsburgh Courier brought an increase in the sales of the newspaper and soon made it a nationally read paper with a circulation exceeding 120,000 newspapers. This change in the readership of the Pittsburgh Courier was brought about by the sale and distribution of the paper by followers of Muhammad whose first task in the sale of any copy was to convince blacks to accept and to be proud of being black. Although the courier refused responsibility for the messenger's column, it enhanced the credibility of the newspaper, which was spread to other black newspapers, such as the New York Amsterdam News, the Philadelphia Tribune, the Chicago New Crusader, the Herald Dispatch, the Newark Herald News, the Herald Dispatch, then a local L.A. shopping guide, was a nationally circulated newspaper as a result of the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad issued a magazine called The Muslim World and USA, and books called The Supreme Wisdom, Volumes 1 and 2, containing condensed sayings of his teachings. In 1956, Brother Johnson X. Hinton was selling jewelry on 125th Street in New York City when a domestic quarrel ensued. When the police arrived, they began beating the husband. Brother Johnson asked, why didn't they just arrest the man? Their answer was to call in a 1013, meaning police in trouble, and beat and arrested Brother Johnson, taking him to the 38th precinct with a hole in his head, where he collapsed into a coma. After learning of the incident, Muslims began marching on the precinct for the brother to be taken to the hospital for aid. At the insistence of Messenger Muhammad, Dr. Thomas Matthews, a renowned black neurosurgeon at Sydenham Hospital, operated on the brother, stating the miracle of his living was attributed to his strong belief in Allah and the teachings of the messenger. Attorney Edward W. Jocko, being retained at the insistence of the messenger on the brother's behalf, charged the city with false arrest and police brutality and was awarded $75,000. In 1958, Brother John Albert answered the door to the police who were looking for his brother-in-law, who was not there. Informing the police of the brother's absence, Brother John closed the door, at which time the police began shooting into the door indiscriminately, unconcerned of the occupants. After the shooting, the police went in to find that the women and children, along with Brother John Albert, were unharmed. They were arrested, all but the children. Being a temple night, the believers were alerted and came to the station, demanding the release. All were, with the exception of Brother John, released. The messenger again engaged the attorney, Edward W. Jocko, who successfully defended them, as the prosecution had placed over 110 false charges. After a four-week trial, in an effort to harass the Muslims, the jury came back with a verdict 
of not guilty. The message began to reach larger and larger audiences, the temples being unable to accommodate the larger numbers of people wanting to hear Mr. Muhammad. So he began speaking in larger halls and arenas. Most historic of all of these was his May 29, 1959 address at the Uline Arena in Washington, D.C., before a crowd of over 10,000 people. Never before had any black ever received honors that were reserved for visiting heads of state. At the airport, he and his entire party were met by the chief of police and received a police escort to their hotel, then to the arena where he spoke and again to the airport after the address. Just 17 years before in this same city, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had been arrested and taken to jail. During the 50s, he also made major appearances in New York City. On October 1955, July 1958, and November 1959. Continuing to build on his program, Mr. Muhammad in the early 50s purchased a large building at 614 East 71st Street, containing six apartments and two stores, where he established Temple No. 2 Grocery and Restaurant. On the upper floors, he moved six families who were able to afford, but were denied suitable housing at their standard of earnings. In the rear of the building, he established a cleaning plant where he put his sons Emmanuel and Nathaniel to work along with some of his followers as garment cleaners. At 71st and South Park, he opened a bakery offering pure whole wheat ingredients, cooked and vegetable oils, or butter at low, low prices. In 1955, he opened a modern clean barbershop at 718 East 79th Street. And in 1957, he moved the clothing store to larger quarters at 79th and Rhodes Street. He opened a clothing garment factory at 451 East 79th Street, where his daughter Ethel worked at managing, designing and supervising workers as the messenger continues to create jobs. There were bigger and better grocery stores, restaurants, bakeries, and clothing stores in almost any white neighborhood. But in the black community all over America, this was a miracle. Here, instead of a black man begging, was a black man attempting to do for self and showing black people how to come into unity and do the same. Mr. Muhammad's idea was more than just a little store, a shop, or a factory. His was and is the vision of people doing operating a nation as other self-respecting and civilized people. In December 1959, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, accompanied by his sons, Herbert and Akbar, took the first trip outside of America. In his visit to some of the governments of Islam, Mr. Muhammad received the greatest respect, welcome, and honor of any so-called American Negro ever to visit that world from America. He was shown through their mills, their government facilities, their schools, their farms, canals, irrigation systems, new projects, and mosques. He was welcomed by all and praised for his work of freedom, justice, and equality, and Islam for his American black people. Mr. Muhammad visited and was received in Istanbul, Turkey, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Cairo, Egypt, where he met with Egyptian President Nasser, Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, the holy city of Mecca in Arabia, the holy city of Medina in Arabia, Damascus, Syria, the cities of Khartoum and Undaman in the Sudan, where he spoke on Sudan National Radio, and Lahore, Pakistan. The messenger returned to America the latter part of January in 1960. This I mean from my heart. Yes, sir. We go. Respect people. And people will respect you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Don't think that you are so great now just because uh, God promised you the kingdom. Wait until you get in it. Yes, sir. As the 1960s unfolded, Messenger Muhammad assigned his son, Akbar Muhammad, who had been educated and graduated from the University of Islam and other Chicago universities to teach Arabic at the University of Islam in Temple No. 7 in New York City. Akbar had accompanied his father on the Messenger's historic world trip through parts of the Muslim world. 
Akbar's complete fluency in Arabic enabled him to serve as his father's interpreter. Later, Akbar was sent by his father to Cairo, Egypt for advanced studies at Al Azhar University, the oldest university in the world, from which he graduated. In 1961, Messenger Muhammad's son, Minister Wallace D. Muhammad, was convicted and jailed for failure to register for the selective service, just as his father was in 1942 and as his brothers Emmanuel, who served in the same prison as his father, and Nathaniel, who was also jailed on the same unwarranted charges 